Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. Sarah, nice to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so this is this is always a topic that we like to cover here, which is which is content marketing, and it's obviously a, a space that's evolving a lot. So you work a lot with B2B and a lot with agencies. Yes. So I, before before we get into things, um, would you mind talking about your background and how you got here and so on? Yeah, yeah. So I am the founder of Tiny Marketing, and I got that name because I was a one person marketing department for seven years for a five company group. So I had to really master being able to do all of the things and really make it stretch because it was yeah. only me and I had hardly any budget. So that is how I got started. I learned to make content marketing basically the feed for all of our marketing and creating core content and being able to repurpose it so we can distribute it in a lot of different ways. So we're constantly in front of our audience while not having to produce an insane amount of content. Yeah, I think that's very attractive, right? Because we're doing this podcast now. I, I love it. It's a labor of love, but it's it's always something that we have to think about and we have yeah. to build the infrastructure for mm -hmm. every week and I'm not complaining, but uh, can you dig into that a little bit? Like it, how do you create the bigger pieces of content that maybe aren't evergreen, but something close to it. Like what's, what's working yeah. right now. <laughs> it's similar to this where yeah. I'll interview an expert and I use that as my core. We'll talk for probably 45 minutes, but I'll structure that interview so it can be broken up into three distinct videos that can be broken up into three videos from there, three micro videos. So I'm able to create three live streams from one interview, and then I repurpose those interviews, those live streams into podcasts. And then I'll take each of those questions that I talk about in those videos and break it down into like a TikTok or a real sized video. And then from there we have audiograms. We can take those topics because, you know, you got to stick to your themes. So take those topics and create like pillar content and blog posts that will go with it. And it's just, it makes it a lot easier when you have that core piece of content that you're going with, that interview, and then you can repurpose it into so many different things. One interview could feed your marketing for two months. Yeah, th that's great. And it's, it's definitely sounds like a very effective tactic, you know, to be able to repurpose this stuff. To take a step back though, you know, I think we're talking and working with lots of agencies and a lot of the times, even in larger organizations that might have like a hundred people, there are very few, if any people solely focused on internal marketing, sometimes not even yeah. internal sales, right? So you have the small team, they're like, crap, I've got to like submit on this RFP. I've got to deal with this client fire. And maybe like in a given week, I'll have like an extra two hours of downtime to do, you know, XYZ internal marketing task. And then even then they're going to have trouble thinking, like you talked about the questions that you ask, like that takes a lot of brain power to think about like a deliberate question to ask the specific expert on this thing, much less like mm -hmm. repurposing that and everything. So and I know you work a lot with agencies, like how do you handle Thank that you. problem? Like when you come in the door, like what, what do you do first? Yeah. So first thing I do is I go in with like a batching mindset where I'll plan out a quarter of their content. So let's say we want to do one interview a month and then create it into a bunch of different things. I'll find who I'm going to be interviewing and I'll create briefs for them all at one time. So I have all of the questions, how I'm gonna break it down into the different videos, all planned out in my creative brief in one day. I'll do that all in one day at the beginning of the quarter of the end of the previous quarter. And then I can plan everything out. But all of the hard strategic work was done in a batching situation. And then I'll try and do all of the interviews within a one or two day stretch so everything can be batched. And I mean, I get it. Agencies do not have time to market themselves. And I see that a lot because I, I partner with so many agencies. 
And oftentimes, I think I'm going into this situation writing for their clients, but it turns out that I'm actually doing marketing for the agency themselves. And yeah, you're in the weeds with your clients. I get it. But that's why you want to work with a marketing expert who knows what they're doing. Right. So so to take a step back on that, tied to that is like the problem of the tragedy when content isn't seen by anyone. So you put all this energy into content and then the people that you want to see it, don't see it. And that happens all the time. Right. And I think it probably happened. I mean, you you would know better than I do, but in my experience, it happens more in B2B because the audiences are smaller. Right. So Mm -hmm. like we work with, with agency, a number of agencies that go after software, but software is a huge area and they might be going after, well, we want to work with B2B software brands between X and Y size that have this sort of product, right? So their total addressable market might be like 3000 companies. So can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Like before you get Mm -hmm. to the batching, before you get to the bundling and, you know, the the creating of of that sort of like epic content, how are you deciding like what you're going to create, who you're trying to reach and how you're going to reach them? And then if you could give it like a specific case study or example, that would be, that would be awesome. Yeah. Looking at a specific customer profile, we'll say, or a customer avatar, you know exactly who you want to see it. A lot of people obsess over big numbers. I want that high traffic. I want everybody to see my content, but really it only matters that the right people are seeing your content. So pull them into it. Start asking them questions. There's influencers within all of these teams, within the companies that you're trying to sell to, get them involved in your content. Make them the person that you interview for your show. Ask them to respond so they could have a quote within your article. So you're building a relationship. Make it sort of like a content marketing, account-based marketing hybrid. So you're including the accounts that you want to sell to within your content and you're building those relationships. And by having those conversations, you start to learn their pain points. And that makes it a lot easier to figure out what you should be talking about in your marketing. They help guide your marketing and you're building a relationship at the same time. Makes sense. And with that, how are you getting this in front of the right people, right? Because like we're creating a podcast right now. Nobody owns podcasts. It's, it's you know, RSS or whatever it is. It's a protocol. We'll market this on Facebook. We'll, you know, do some some various targeting ads. We have a newsletter. But I'm still not sure if we're getting to the right people, you know, like, and that would be even yeah. harder. I mean, agencies, it's, it's a relatively big B2B niche. Like if I wanted to reach B2B VPs and stuff, I get there's LinkedIn. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, how are you, how are you disseminating this? Yeah. So one, getting them involved in the content is, an, is the easiest way to get them to actually see the content because they're involved in it. So getting those strategic partnerships, let's say, okay, you're an agency and you partner with a SaaS, a marketing SaaS that your company might use, that will double up your impressions because they will share that content with their audience. Let's say so many of my own clients use HubSpot. If you partnered with HubSpot and they sent it out to their email list, then you're going to get a lot more distribution. Of course, it's hard to partner with HubSpot because it's so big, but there are a ton of smaller product companies that agencies can partner with that will get you in front of the people that you want to be in front of without without having to spend too much money. Plus sponsorship newsletters are another way. If you're willing to spend a little bit money, use sponsorship newsletters to get in front of that audience. For marketing in particular, there are Slack groups that they're for networking, but you can sponsor posts in there to be able to get them in front of people. And don't forget about like things like this, podcasts, webinars. You can mention the content that you've created for them when you're talking to them in real time and you're already in front of that audience. So making sure to use those PR opportunities to distribute. Yeah, I, I really like that because I, I think a lot of us probably aren't thinking about niche sponsorships enough. It seems very, very classic and tried and true. And it's you know something that bigger, kind of more marketing savvy tech companies especially do all the time. Are there any, you know, I, I think a lot of the people are thinking, great, Slack groups, sponsorship newsletters, 
these are very niche, especially Slack groups. It's not like they're publicized very well. Are right. there any resources, you know, like how do you, if you want to breach a particular niche, like how are you going about finding these things? Are there any resources you like to turn to? Yeah. I mean, super path on Slack. That is a big one for content marketing. I have it up. That's why I'm looking yeah. at my screen right now. Cause cool. I'm looking at the super path one right now. There are literally thousands of marketers in there chatting right now that yeah. you can be building relationships with and doing like virtual conferences where everybody's chatting in that side panel, use those opportunities to have those conversations and build relationships. I think that people get too focused on mass distribution instead of building relationships, especially agencies. It's all about relationship building. So build those relationships as you're doing your content marketing. It goes a lot further. It's not just a random article that they're reading anymore. It's, I have an investment in this. I've had a conversation with somebody about this. Sure, that, that makes sense. And to kind of dig into what you're actually doing. So can you talk about how you're engaging with clients? Like, are you saying, hey, this person over here, here's like the high level content you should implement over the next 90 days. Or are you actually like helping them find partners to do it? Or are you doing it yourself? I'd love to just kind of get a little more background on that. Yeah, so we'll build out the strategy together. I will generally have a meeting with them at the end of Q2 and we start talking about what kind of content we wanna create for the next quarter and what partnerships would make sense. Depending on the engagement, I will reach out to partners myself and or they prefer to do it themselves. It depends. But specifically with marketing agencies, I usually do it because I have a, a big network of other marketers because I have my own show, Tiny Marketing Show, where I'm interviewing marketing experts. So I have those connections that I'm able to pass on to other people. And then always just asking for referrals from your guests, like who would be an awesome person to talk to, to bring into, my content to create a partnership with you can always get great advice i swear i learn more from the people that i interview than anything else anything i could read online i'm interviewing these brilliant marketers and they are connecting me to tons of cool people resources that make sense so bringing in those partnerships helps in a million ways. You create your content and you're building relationships and learning from them at the same time. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and we do as well here. I, I forget to do that, to ask for, for podcast referrals. So you reminded me and I'll unfortunately make you the victim of that after that by asking you for the <laughs> referral. So that's a great, that's a great call. I, I think one, one objection that some people might have is like, I don't have, either I don't have the time or I'm just not that gregarious I'm not that I'm maybe more of a private person I think that and another one is like okay great an owner of a, of a boutique agency might be able to run this I think it's harder to get a busy employee to do it that doesn't already like have a lot of poise and, and motivation to do it so can you talk about that a little bit like does it have to be a podcast and if not then what what else are you thinking about um, in terms of no, content? it doesn't have to be a podcast and it doesn't even have to be in the structure that I'm talking about. It doesn't yeah. have to be interviews, although it's helpful because you build those relationships. There's a couple different options. I've actually worked with an agency who outsourced their video personality. They hired somebody to do the interviews and create those videos for them. So that's an option is just hiring someone who is a interesting person and good at interviews and having them be the face of your content. Or you could just go on a completely different option. You can use scripted video if you're still comfortable of being on video, but you're not like, mm, I don't know about interviewing people. You can use scripted video or scripted podcasts, or you could just go with written content and really go all in on the SEO, create really meaty pillar content like Andy Crestadino from Orbit Media. He's amazing with his written content and it gets him far. You don't have to do podcasts or videos if you're not comfortable with that. Right. And, and I guess philosophically, like, do you think it's better to have multiple channels so that you have written content and you're starting there and then adding things or 
I've also heard the, you know, the other philosophy is have one thing you're really, really good at, and then just double down on that and don't worry about being everywhere. So, you know, like some agencies are really good at retargeting and paid ads. Others have a podcast. We have a podcast. Others focus on written. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I'm from the philosophy of like, people all have different learning types. So it's important to use different mediums so you can reach those different people. So I like having a mix of written podcast and video, and I do that through repurposing. So it's all based on that core content of the interview, but I repurpose it into all of those different mediums. I didn't start that way though. So I will say if you're just starting out, just start with the one thing and that's okay. (laughs) Just if you're willing to commit to one podcast a month, commit to that and keep that cadence it's something and that's better than nothing. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess kind of tied to that is, are there any trends that you're seeing maybe on a vertical or industry level for how people are consuming content and the cadence? I just feel like it's so idiosyncratic and we all just kind of throw up our hands and say, do people, you know, different people consume content different ways. Like hypocritically, I don't consume that many business podcasts. I get most of my business information from books, <laughs> like to I'll, yeah. I'll read books and then I'll listen to fun podcasts or like nerdy philosophical podcasts and stuff like that. And I'm sure that it's very, very idiosyncratic across the board, but I, I love, like, I think what's really useful is like, well, is there some study that says SaaS new bit or SaaS marketers like to consume content this way versus that? Like, I love to hear your thoughts on that. If that informs what yeah. you recommend. I survey my audience, so I know exactly what they want. <laughs> and so B2B in-house marketers, YouTube videos and podcasts were the highest that they like to consume. So that was, I was, and I was, I was surprised. That I was like, oh, all right, all right, all right. Everyone's like, do a short form content, do reels and TikTok, but that audience wanted YouTube videos and podcasts. So I don't have any studies off the top of my mind except for my own. And I surveyed about 200 people in B2B marketing and that was their preference. So I suggest that everybody do that. It's not that expensive. What I did was I, well, I surveyed my own audience, but then I also paid to expand that through a paid audience, but it gave me so much insight. I knew where they hang out online. I know what kind of content they want to see. I know what formats they want to see it in. So survey your audience, ask them what they want, because every audience is different. And you want to really target exactly the people that you want to sell to. Right. That makes sense. So a lot of this is kind of leaning towards the podcast, which, which I've definitely gotten, gotten a lot of value from, but I think what's tricky about it is that it's harder to, uh, and I guess this is probably the same for most content marketing, but it's harder to measure, mm-hmm. you know, if we're doing outbound, we're looking at prospects and meetings, if we're doing inbound advertising, you're looking at conversions and cost per click. With a podcast, it's like this big mishmash of like possibly valuable things, right? Where you have, you're building partnerships, you're like networking, you're also building content and getting organic inbound, but that takes a long time. You're, you know, you're, you're kind of like getting ideas out there. So you're thinking, you're learning. So I'd love to just like understand like when and what can you measure? How much do you have to just come to terms with not really knowing what the value is and having it be abstract. Like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think with both video and podcast that it's really more around awareness. And that's where the true value comes in is people realizing you exist at all. And um, you can see, you can measure that somewhat through the traffic that you're getting from, I mean, definitely use Bitly. So, you know, you're using tracking URLs on all of your show notes pages and measure that through your analytics to see how much inbound traffic you're getting from them and measure your traffic on YouTube and podcast for sure. But I would start keeping track of like those guests that you have, the people that you're interviewing, what's turning into referral partnerships, where are you getting jobs from it and start to measure that. Use your CRM and see how those partnerships are really adding up. But if you're looking for quick turnaround leads, people that want to buy immediately, I would say 
getting out there and partnering on other people's content is the biggest way that I have seen. When I'm on other people's webinars, live streams, podcasts, when I'm a guest, that's where I'm getting a ton of inbound leads that uh, turn into sales immediately. Right. Because like all of these people that listen to my podcast, they know who I am already and they might be working with me already or they might be, you know, lingering and watching me until they're ready. But those people are new, but they are also people that I would sell to and they reach out quickly and they tell me exactly how they found me. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think that on the the content you're creating yourself for your own channel on that side of the fence, there's the incentive to get like referral partners or, you know, people you could do business with in the future on your show. And then there's the incentive to build just like really interesting content that your, your audience will like. And then yeah. there's also the meta incentive to have people on that interest you because then you'll be more energized and then that'll be a better interview than than yeah. somebody else, right? Oh, you learn from cool people. You're you start to become friends with them, the people that you're interviewing. Right. It's a, it's a win win. Yeah. And ultimately though, I think that like one of those goals has to win over the others, you know, because like if we just had on people that we could do business with all day, like nobody would want to listen to our podcast. Yeah, it could be and, pretty boring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and and my thinking is like okay, maybe we'll get, win some deals like that. But the cost of creating a podcast is so high that like there's no reason to do it unless you're building something that is going to be like useful and entertaining to, to listen to. So to bring that, hopefully bring this to a question, I guess like how do you balance those things? You know, how do you balance the measurable with the with building something that's that's entertaining and useful? Yeah, make sure that as you're tracking those metrics, that you're seeing growth and you're seeing that it's all evening out, that people are listening, but it's also turning into traffic to your website and that you're actually staying focused on those pain points for your clients. So you can have these entertaining guests that are fun to listen to, but try and always bring it home. So you're staying on theme for your clients and that they're walking away from something that's tangible in every episode, whether it's an entertaining guest or somebody who would just be a good partner. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And to hopefully take your advice right now <laughs> to make this tangible for the audience. So like, let's say I'm listening, I'm, I'm the, an owner, a partner in an agency. We've got a team of like 20 people. They're overworked. We've got two hours left per, per week to market. Like what's like one thing that I can do right now on the content marketing front? So something that I do when I'm overworked with clients, because I'm obviously doing my own marketing too, is I make my own marketing for my business part of the process. I make it a project in my teamwork. The contractors are assigned to it. And if I need to outsource pieces of it, I outsource pieces of it. But I always make sure that marketing my business is a priority because if I'm not bringing in new clients, I'm failing. I that's that's my job is to do that. Plus, as a marketing agency, if you're not marketing yourself, it doesn't look good. You go to an agency website and you see their blog hasn't been updated since 2019 or their podcast just stopped running <laughs> a couple months ago. It's noticeable it's noticeable. So it looks good on both fronts that you're attracting new clients, but also people who are coming to your website are like, okay, they know what they're doing. They're consistent with their marketing. They're, they're doing what they say they'll do. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, that's, and I think it's either like take the little date thing off. So it seems evergreen or, uh, or ship every week kind of, kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. And if you're doing a podcast, you can't get away with taking the date off. It's right. It's right. there. <laughs> if it's a podcast for sure, that, that makes sense. Um, so, so Sarah, this is great. I think there's like a, a lot that people can run with from this. How could people follow what you're up to get in touch, all that good stuff. Yeah. So my website and all my social media is Sarah Noel block, my full name. And I partner with agencies to help them find great writers for podcast shows, blogs, all the things, video scripts. And uh, you can find all my information at sarahnoelblock.com. Awesome. We'll get that, that all linked up. And uh, Sarah, thank you so much. appreciate it. Thank you.